Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Shakespeare and Company. Um, I imagine you can all hear me, but just those of you right at the back, just give me a little wave if you can hear me. Okay, okay, thumbs up. Thank you. Um, wow, Champs Elysees, eat your heart out. Um, <laughs> We're delighted to welcome uh, Nick Laird and Zadie Smith to Shakespeare and Company tonight in the third and final of our collaborations for this season at least with the New York University Creative Writing Program. Nick Laird's fourth book of poems, Feel Free, is an extraordinarily rich work that straddles the Atlantic in subject matter and influences, resonating with the cadences of his literary forebears, Heaney and Whitman, yet still feeling resolutely contemporary, deeply personal and socially engaged. In Feel Free, Nick Laird is utterly at ease with poetic conventions and so takes great delight in subverting them, while the English language bends with almost embarrassing eagerness to his will. I can't recall, for example, the dry vocabulary of technology and bureaucracy ever being employed to such poetic or affecting ends as Nick Laird does in Extra Life, and certainly not between the same covers as the tenderness and quiet devastation one finds in poems like Silk Cut. Feel Free is a collection whose rhythms and images resonate in the mind long after it's been put down. In addition to Feel Free, Nick Laird is the author of the collections Go Giants, To A Fault, which won the Oldenburg Poetry Prize, and On Purpose, which earned him the Somerset Maugham Award, and the Geoffrey Faber Memorial Prize. He's also the author of the novels Modern Gods, A Glover's Mistake, and Ugly Monkey, and the editor alongside Don Patterson of The Zoo of the New. Zadie Smith is the author of the novels Swing Time, NW, On Beauty, The Autograph Man, and White Teeth, as well as the 2010 essay collection Changing My Mind. She's a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature and was listed as one of Granter's 20 best young British novelists in 2003 and 2013. White Teeth won multiple literary awards, including the James Tate Black Memorial Prize, the Whitbread First Novel Award and the Guardian First Book Award. On Beauty was shortlisted for the Man Booker Prize and won the Orange Prize for Fiction 2006. NW was shortlisted for the Bailey's Prize for Fiction 2013 and Swing Time was longlisted for the Man Booker Prize in 2017. This year saw the release of Zadie Smith's second collection of essays. When choosing her topics, she casts her net widely, covering technology, comedy, literature, libraries and art, as well as the three Bs. Brexit, bathrooms and Justin Bieber. <laughs> Just as in her fiction, Zadie Smith writes essays with an irresistible, contagious empathy and with a lightness of touch that still somehow almost miraculously leaves an indelible mark upon the reader's consciousness. Spanning the years 2010 to 2017, the book also acts, perhaps inadvertently, as a valuable record of the shifts and looming upheavals in American, British and European culture during that time. And through the freshness of Zadie Smith's reflections and the originality of her insight, provides an alternative, undogmatic, compassionate perspective for a civilization apparently determined to eat its own tail. One of the pieces also happens to contain perhaps my favorite opening line of any modern essay. I met J.G. Ballard once. It was a car crash. <laughs> the title of Zadie Smith's new collection, Feel Free. Please join me in welcoming Nick Laird and Zadie Smith to Shakespeare and Company. So this evening we're going to meander a little bit uh, between the two books, between the two collections. Uh, both uh, Nick and Zadie are going to read for us at different moments um, during the evening. And we're going to uh, perhaps get to the root of um, how two people come to release uh, two books with the same title. Um, Zadie, I'd like to begin yeah. with you. You wrote recently um, after the passing of Philip Roth um, about his his dedication to fiction, his commitment to fiction. And it's true that Roth didn't particularly write many essays. You know, he wrote right. occasional introductions, but it was very limited. Um, one thing that I think astonishes people uh, with your work is your aptitude for, for both forms. You seem to turn your hand quite uh, with, with e equally comfortably to writing fiction and to writing essays. So I guess, first of all, I want to know if that is the way it feels to you. And also, when you are writing essays, do you feel that you're writing from the same place as when you're writing fiction, from the same internal space? Um, oh, yeah, it's on, hi. Uh, I mean, uh, you're English, I'm English. We, we, you're trained to write essays. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that, that's, that's the uh, difference maybe between uh, English writers and American writers. I, sp I spent three years in college doing nothing but writing long form tedious literary <laughs> essays that that was my job and i i did think when i came to new york like for instance a, a critic like james wood an english critic who's a wonderful critic but part of the surprise for an american reader was he come basically straight from college straight from graduate work and he was just a professional mm -hmm. at making these kind of essays but i think most english students are so for me uh, my essays are just like 
homework. You know, I never really got out of, the, <laughs> of that <laughs> mental state. Someone sets me an assignment, I do it, it's homework. Uh, and uh, it feels uh, good because it's a contained thing, it's productive, it gets finished. None of these things can be said for novels, you know, they take mm -hmm. forever. It's not a contained space. Uh, you can't get marks for them, really. They're mm -hmm. just these weird, ambivalent messes. So, so um, an essay is just a way of feeling like I have a job. Mm -hmm. that's, that's how I think about <laughs> it. Yeah. And um, in, but, but in writing an essay, because I, I understand what you mean about being sort of being trained in that in Britain, but I think one thing that we're, we're also trained to do is to give the impression that we know what we're talking about. Right. And one thing that... I had to unlearn that. Yeah, well, yeah, and one thing that was striking <laughs> about reading um, the essays in Feel Free, because I'd read a lot of them over the years, but reading them all, all together like that was actually sort of how frequently uh, you insist upon uh, not being an expert in anything, not perhaps knowing a great deal, and uh, beyond sort of novel writing, which, uh, which you feel at home, and feeling quite sort of lost with, um, right. with other subjects. And I, I was just wondering, that's, there's a certain... I guess there must be a certain vulnerability uh, to to making your to to declaring yourself um, not to be an expert in that way. I mean, I, the one thing I remember about college, I and mean, we were at the college at the same time, is that the whole way to get through those exams was to pretend to to absolute knowledge, right? That would that the tone you needed in an English degree was the tone from the mount, um, and that's what I got very good at doing. But then, and never saying, I. You wrote mm -hmm. all essays from this distant, objective voice, and then when I got to America and realized that everybody was saying I all the time. <laughs> it was a kind of a novelty. I thought, oh, you can say I, and it's not illegal, it's allowed. Mm. So you, you can express this more kind of ambivalent uh, self. Um, but, I mean, Nick knows uh, the, the, the declaration of ignorance is not um, a humble brag. I literally don't know anything about most things. <laughs> is that fair to say? You're gonna ignore me? <laughs> <laughs> like if the kids ask me does the sun go around the moon or does the earth go like there are, there's a huge lacunas of absolute ignorance in every area of my life so uh, one of the things about assignments is that it's, it's a chance to learn something mm -hmm. about something for a period and then bore you with it for a few months <laughs> And Nick, do you find with? Um, I mean, is Let, it, is let's just clarify: <laughs> the, the, the Earth goes round the sun. See, there you go. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> now we know. It's good. Good to know. But do you find? Do you find as a poet? I mean, I guess poetry, in a way, as a form, is one of the sort of the best we have, perhaps the best literary form we have for kind of writing about that which cannot be written about, about sort of in somehow sort of capturing um, capturing the ineffable. In um, in text, and I was wondering, do you do you feel that you write from a sort of a similar <laughs> position of ignorance? As I was saying? Well, <laughs> let's call it non-knowing. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think so. I, th I don't think you go into a poem knowing where the poem will go, mm -hmm. and, and if you do, it's probably not going to work. Um, you want to be surprised. You want the poem to take you somewhere, so, you know, that is uh, sort of uh, shocking to you in some way. Um, I'm not interested in the kind of poetry that sort of affirms uh, what you already know or um, uh, sort of prejudices or suspicions that you have. I'm interested in poetry that does something else. So I, I think the position of non-knowing is a strong one. I, I don't know what your father was like, but I never in my life heard my father say, I don't know, mm -hmm. even though there was a lot he didn't know. But My it, mother's like that too. Yeah, yeah we come from <laughs> those people. But so in response, <laughs> uh, it's like, it feels incredibly freeing to say, mm -hmm. I don't know. The answer to that, I don't know how that works, you know. So um, well, we've sort of t tried to take a different tack on it, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was just, you made me think just then of that sort of, that famous Wittgensteinian line of kind of that which cannot be spoken about must be passed over in silence. Is yeah, I never got that. I never <laughs> thought that was right, actually. Uh, um, Wittgenstein loved the aphorism, but, mm -hmm. he, but it often at the, the, the sort of the cost of sense. And I think the opposite is the true, like in poetry in particular, what the entire game is about trying to uh, to get at that which cannot be said. So fortunately, we have other ways of getting at, apart from language, we have forms and auras and, uh, and repetitions and, and things that conjure sonic webs or a kind of gauzy, you know, gauze of sound. So we can induce things like a kind of trance-like state. There are different ways that language works which aren't just to do with the meanings of words. Mm -hmm. 
I'd like to return to that idea, actually, of the the I, the presence um, of sort of writing oneself in, into one's work. I mean, in, actually, in uh, your collections, A.D., you write um, about how, um, in one of the essays, you're talking about how Swing Time, which you were working on at the time, is the first time that you've written uh, a novel, right. or perhaps any fiction, I think, in the in the first right. person. Um, and obviously, the, the, the essay form, I guess, particularly when one is writing as a sort of declared non-expert, it will require a lot more of the the eye, um, right. a lot more of the presence. But I was just curious, as a sort of a as a fiction writer, is there a do you find there's a sort of a Zadie Smith a persona of Zadie Smith, the essayist? I mean, in reading it as well, you write about, right. for example, your brothers, one of whom is a comedian, one of whom right. is a rapper. Both of those professions almost they, require yeah. the assumption of a personality. Right. Everyone in my family both has a persona and a fake name. Mm -hmm. It's a really strange <laughs> phenomenon. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, but to me, I mean, that, that may be where I differ with the younger generation that I don't, to me it's all rhetoric. I don't, I don't consider it a, a intimate or personal expression, you know. Mm -hmm. I don't think of it that way. To write an I is just another kind of rhetorical process than the kind of third person I'm used to using. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't feel closer to me. I don't really know what people mean by that. To me, intimacy is something which happens between people in real life. Mm -hmm. It's not something that happens between writers and readers, it really. I, I'm, I put a voice there and it stays there, but I'm not present. You're never present in language. Language is its own thing. It operates independently from you. It has its own life. Um, that's what it's there for. Um, and the idea that I sometimes find it with my students that if you just say I strongly enough or you just say I really really hate it I really really like it that you will be present at the moment of reading mm -hmm. you never are all that's left is language you don't all you can do is control language as, as effectively as you want to create certain effects but you aren't there mm -hmm. ever and I'm never there either I'm only there in my life with Nick with my children with my friends that's where I am the mm -hmm. page is something else entirely mm, which is similar to when you're talking about um, at the moment you're in a book about the the sort of the memoirist and the sort of the, for what strikes you as sort of a false distinction between right. uh, between writing memoir or in writing and writing fiction. For you, it sort of seems to come, come from I the same I just don't place. understand the distinction. I, I remember doing an event um, in New Mexico with Knausgaard, the Norwegian, and, and we were talking on stage, and, and as we were talking, I realized that people in the audience really believe that this man in his mid-40s remembered putting a beer in the fridge when he was eight <laughs> and having a conversation, <laughs> detailed conversation with his father about where the beer went on. And that, that kind of fascinated me that that was possible to believe such mm. a thing. A and uh, that's not what writing is about, mm. you know. It doesn't mean that what he's writing is untrue, um, but it's, those kind of memories aren't, aren't really accessible. Mm. I don't remember what I said to Nick yesterday in any detail, mm. and certainly not, you know, 20 years ago. Um, but uh, maybe that's the difference between readers and writers, mm -hmm. the, the conception of what's true or not in that mm -hmm. sense. And I, and I was wondering, Nick, does that, do you sort of ascribe to the same conception of language, that's, that same sort of distance? I mean, I'm somebody who's never attempted to write poetry in my life. Like, I don't consider myself to have a particularly poetic sensibility, but I kind of always hold poetry up as something which, I don't know, which seems to have perhaps an, an honesty or a proximity to the writer that perhaps fiction doesn't I don't have. know. <laughs> uh, people who don't read or write poetry always hold it in a very high regard. <laughs> um, you know, people have a kind of schizophrenic attachment to poetry when they die or when they get married or, you know, they want to turn to it, but they're not really there in where the Where are you in the every day? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> where are you, my friend? Um, <laughs> and they say, you know, it's the, it's the sort of pinnacle of literature, but let's say financially that's not <laughs> <laughs> that's not you know reflected um it's uh, I, I i you know obviously it's i love you're uncorrupted by wealth i think right. well yeah well it's actually in <laughs> totally some way that is interesting we don't we don't have to respond to the market so it does leave you kind of free in that you can literally write what you want so you can write what is interesting to you so i think in that regard there's no responsiveness. So in terms of late capitalism, poetry is free because there is no market for poetry. So that does make it in a way idiosyncratic <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> interesting. But I, I don't, I don't, you know, I, I think it's amazing poetry. Um, and I think it is the pinnacle of literature, but that's because I write it. <laughs> I'm not sure that, well, I'm not sure novelists think that. Mm -hmm.
No. Do they? <laughs> By the way, it. I remember what you said to me yesterday. Oh, you do? Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I mean, novelists are envious of poets, that's for sure, of a kind of purity of expression. Um, but it's so different. Like, I, 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 if we're um, in a bad mood with each other, I would say poetry is like the song of the self. Um, prose writing is, is social by definition. You know, it's about other people. But, uh, Except all those other people oh, are also you. me. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, okay, yeah. he wins. <laughs> I give up that one. And concerning, um, like in, in the introduction, um, when I was speaking about sort of potential forebears, like people see sort of poets writing, uh, writing in a tradition, in a way. And I wonder if sort of with essayists, perhaps it's sort of less so. There, but there were two names that came to me while reading the collection. Um, well, two, two that you actually mentioned, but one particularly I thought of even before I came to that were uh, John Berger and uh, Seneca. And it's, I, yeah. It's, wow. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> but it struck me that sort of like these two, the, these were two writers who were kind of writing from quite different uh, perspectives. I mean, Seneca, there's very much this sense of giving a lesson, right? Um, of sort of instruction. Uh, whereas with John Berger, which I, I'd say was a sort of the tradition perhaps which you cleave closest to is this sense more to do with sort of uh, opening out and sort right. of uh, demystification. But I was just wondering, do you have sort of, do you consider you have sort of essay writing forebears, sort of people who've influenced what you do? I love both those writers, but they came late to me. I only came to Berger through Jeff Dyer. Mm. And, and the connection there is about class because Jeff is always interested in English writing, which isn't middle or upper middle class, mm. which is very, very rare in England. So Berger is consistently interesting for that reason, because he's open to the idea of a kind of public spirit and a public voice. I love Berger and I love Seneca, but when I was growing up, I read Hazlitt, mm -hmm. um, Wolf, and I can still, when I'm writing, I'm, what I'm often trying to do is delete the wolf <laughs> mm -hmm. from my habits, but it's very hard because I read her very young and I can't help it. And actually, Alice Walker, and there's a book of essays by her that my mother had, um, which had this kind of, it's the first time I'd heard that American conversational voice. Mm -hmm. It was kind of open and partly confessional and incredibly engaging to me because I guess as a child, she was in a mixed race relationship, she had a mixed race daughter, and I didn't have many examples of that. And so on my mother's shelf, I took it out and it was a kind of surreptitious way of mm -hmm. reading about my mother. Or So those are the kind of voices I thought about but wolf above all just because um i don't know if you're a girl writer in england when i was growing up you, there wasn't you, there was a kind of 18th 17th 18th 19th century heroes but wolf was the closest it sounds ridiculous but even in the 70s she was the closest i could think of mm. now i'd like to talk a little bit uh, in a what in a moment about um the kind of the period of time of, uh, th uh, that these uh, essays and these poems were written. Um, but I think it would be good first to hear Nick uh, read a little bit, because poetry is a very hard thing uh, to talk about without having a sense of how it goes. So um, if Nick, if, you, uh, if, if you'd like to go to the lectern or okay. if you'd like to sure. stay here. We'll just get the mic So, what do you want me to read? You said, that I, shall I choose? I have like a wish. Okay. Maybe begin with glitch. Okay. Um, Adam was going to tell, hello. <laughs> um, I'm embarrassed to read these because every time I come to... <laughs> I asked them not to do that for me. <laughs> it's a lot. <laughs> Anyway, it's nice of them, but <laughs> so um, I, I start off with the first poem in the book. Um, it's called Glitch. So I fell over one day. Um, I, I got up out of bed and I fainted, and um, I had to get stitches in my forehead. Uh, and uh, whenever I was unconscious, I, I was in this place where everything seemed to be amazing, and then I came back to real life and you know it was fine but it wasn't as good as the place I'd been before so this poem is just about that um, yeah I haven't got a have you got a watch or a timer thing I'll read like three or something okay glitch 
More than ample a dead fall of one meter eighty to split my temple apart on the herringbone parquet and crash the OS. Tripping an automated shutdown in this specific case and halting all external workings of the heated, moist robot I currently inhabit. I am out cold for some time, and when my eyes roll in, you're there to help me over to our bed. As I explain at length how taken I am with the place I'd been, had been compelled to leave. Airlifted out mid-gesture, mid-sentence, risen of a sudden like a bubble to the surface. A victim snatched and bundled out, helplessly, from sunlight, the usual day. And all particulars of my other life fled except the sense that lasts for hours of being wanted somewhere else. Any, <laughs> any other ones I should shall I choose? <laughs> No, no, don't, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that. Don't do that. Because, you know, if you do that for one poem and then you don't do it for all the poems, <laughs> you know, I'm going to feel upset. So don't do it at all. Um, Adam has given me a list, a weird list of some poems here. I'm not going to read these. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Shall I read that? Okay, I don't know why it's become a communal decision about what I read. <laughs> It's like everyone's fucking opinion was... Uh, did you write the poems? <laughs> okay. I'll re I read it. Um, I, re I read the title poem, Feel Free. I've read this so many times in Paris. I'm sorry to all the other writers I teach with at NYU. You're going to have to hear it again. So um, you might ask why we both have books out by the same title this year. It's a question that I ask a lot. Um, <laughs> So I wrote a poem called Feel Free that was in the New Yorker about four years ago and um, Ziri was trying to get a title for her essay collection and then she said, I know, I've got the perfect title, it's Feel Free and I was like, yeah, there's a problem with that. <laughs> it, uh, <laughs> and then f she went on and on about it and for some peace in the house I said, all right, give me a week and I'll try and get a different title and I went to speak to my editor at Faber and he said, don't be ridiculous. Your book has been called Feel Free for four years. It has to be called Feel Free. All the poems are about forms of freedom. And so I went back to Ziti after a week and said, I've tried other titles. I think I have to, you know, stick with Feel Free. Um, so you, you can't have it. And she said, oh, it's too late. It's already gone to the publishers. <laughs> um, so that was fine. And then she said, um, oh, it's all right, we can, both, we can both have Feel Free as a title. I was like, well, it's a bit weird. Yours comes out first. and <laughs> Okay, I, I'll run with it, but I'm not massively happy. And then, uh, and then she published hers in January, and the day after she comes to me and says, yeah, I think you should change the title of your, of your, <laughs> of your book. Anyway. <laughs> Feel Free. I mention uh, Harvey, that's my son, and Catherine is my daughter in this poem. One, it's in three parts. To deal with all the sensational loss, I like to interface with Earth. I like to do this in a number of ways. It's like a fucking challenge. <laughs> it's too much. <laughs> okay. <laughs> to deal with all the sensational loss, I like to interface with Earth. I like to do this in a number of ways. I like to feel the work I am exerting being changed, the weight of my person refigured, and I like to hang above the ground, thus snorkeling, hammocks, alcohol. <laughs> I, I also like the mind to feel a kind of neutral buoyancy, and to that end I set aside a day a week, Shabbat, to not act. Having ceded independence to the sunset, I will not be shaving, illuminating rooms, or raising the temperature of food. If occasionally I like to feel the leavening of being near a much larger unnatural tension, I walk off a Sunday through the high fields of Blanket Bog, Saxifrage, a few thin belted Galloways, rounding Loch Malin to stand by the form of beauty upheld in a scrubby acre at Craig and Devsky, 
What I do duck and enter under a capstone mapped by rival empires of yellow feather moss and powdery white lichen. I like then to stop, crouched, and press my back on a housing of actual rock, coldness which lives for a while on the skin. And I like when I give you the night feed, Harvey, how you're concentrating on it, fists clenched, eyes shut, like this is bliss. Two. I like a steady disruption. I like it when the solid mantle turns to shingle and water rushes up it over and over in love. My white noise machine from Argos is set to crashing wave, but I'm not averse to the presence of numerous and minute quanta moving very fast in unison. Occasions when a light wind undulates the ears of wheat or a hessian sack of pearl barley seed is sliced with a pocket knife and pours. I like the way it sounds pattering on stone. I like how the starlings over Monty cohere and separate their bodies into one cyclonic symphony. And I like that the hawk of the mind catches at their purse, pulse, call, arc. I like the excitation passing as a shadow rippled back and how the bag is snatched, rolled slack, straight, falciform, mouthing, bulbing, a pumping heart. I like to interface with millions of colored pixels depicting attractive people procreating on a screen, itself dependent on rare metals mined by mud gray children who trudge up bamboo scaffolding above a grayish red lake of belching mud. I like how the furnace burning earth instills in me reflexive gestures of timidity, self-pity and deference as I walk across the kinder surfaces, grass, say, or sand, Unable ever to meet with my eyes the gaze of the sun. Three. I can imagine that my first and fifth marriages will be to the same human, a woman. The first marriage working well enough that we decide to try again as soon as it's, you know, mutually convenient. I can see that. I like the fact we're super cooled star matter. Even if I can't envisage you as anything other than warm and bleeding. The thing is... I can be persuaded fairly easily to initiate immune responses by the fake safety signals of national anthems, cleavage, family photographs, country lanes, large-eyed mammals, fireworks, the King James Bible, Nina Simone singing the Twelfth of Never, cave paintings, coffins, dolphins, dolmens, but I like it also when the fat impasto of the canvas gets slashed by a tourist with a claw hammer and a glimpse is caught of what you couldn't say. Entanglement I like, spooky action at a distance, analogizing some little thing, including this long glance across the escalators, or how you know the song before you switch the station on. When a photon of light meets a half-silvered mirror and splits, one meets the superposition of two, being twinned, and this repeats. Tickling your back, Catherine, to get you to sleep, I like to lie here with my eyes closed and think about my school friends' houses before choosing one to walk through slowly, room by sunlit room. All right, I know that seemed to last forever. No, no, if it seemed to last forever for you, imagine what it was like for me. <laughs> I'm gonna read two short poems, one's called Fathers. So the book, Feel Free, is sort of about um, restrictions. I'm 42, um, as is Zadie, and uh, you get to that bit where your children are, are literally killing you every day and, <laughs> and your, your parents are, are, are dying, so you feel very kind of boxed in and, uh, and, and the book is kind of about ways of feeling free to, even despite that, so in restrictions. This poem is called Fathers and then I'll read one short poem called Silk Cup. Fathers. We set a saucer full of water on the kitchen sill and check it before breakfast for three days straight until it's all evaporated. I think it's more like that. But don't you understand that Jesus lives in the sky? I think the moon is blown out and the trees plucked off the birthday cake and put back with the batteries and all the country of you divided up into the tiniest of slices. But what I've got is microwave popcorn and this ability to whistle every number one single from 1987 onwards. There's no use getting all het up I give you a bed for your tiredness. I give you some bread I have toasted and buttered. I give you a stretch of the earth, baked hard, 
where we follow the shiny beetle holding the shield of himself into noon. I can tuck a cloud under your chin. If it's an advert, the product is love. If it's an element, water. If it's not consistent, that's part of its charm. If it's a bomb, it's a beautiful dud. And I love you, she says, this much. I read one short poem and then I'm going to ha happily not stop reading. So uh, this is called Silk Cut. It's, about the, it's the brand of cigarette that my father smoked for many years. Um, and my, my mother died last year. She was only young. She was 67. And um, uh, this is about my father and I kind of in the aftermath. I was five and stood beside my dad at a junction somewhere in Dublin when I slipped my hand in his and met the red end of a cigarette. But now our hearts are broken. We walk down to the bray side where we can get a proper pint and his voice tears up a bit about the emptiness in the house. And we are going home, waiting at the turn for the traffic when I find I have to stop my hand from taking his. So, uh, well, I said I was going to finish, but... I'm going to read a poem by a good poet, uh, Frank O'Hara, from the, this wonderful anthology, which I'm not in, but I did edit. So, uh, let's finish on a higher note than that one. This is called Animals by Frank O'Hara. It's one of my favorite love poems. Animals. Have you forgotten what we were like then when we were still first rate and the day came fat with an apple in its mouth? It's no use worrying about time. But we did have a few tricks up our sleeves and turned some sharp corners. The whole pasture looked like our meal. We didn't need speedometers. We could manage cocktails out of ice and water. I wouldn't want to be faster or greener than now if you were with me. Oh, you were the best of all my days. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, I'm very conscious there will be questions from the audience, so I won't uh, uh, dominate your time too much longer. But one thing I'd like to talk with both of you about is, I guess, the sort of the period over which these these essays and these poems were written, and the sort of the process of then compiling them into a book. And I, I wonder, perhaps, Zadie, for you, it was, uh, I, I don't know if it's a different process, but I just wonder in the, so these, these essays, they, the, I think the earliest is 2010, the latest right. is, certainly the introduction was 2017, I think you wrote it. And of course, that's something which in Britain and in the United States, particularly, we think of uh, a period of great, great change, a period sort of of, uh, of of great turmoil. And I just wonder, in the com compilation of these essays, in, in reading back over them and deciding which ones to include, and perhaps deciding which ones in, in what order uh, to to place them in the book. Did it? Uh, did you get a sense that you were putting together almost sort of a, a time capsule of a particular time in culture, but also in right. in your own life? I think the thing we felt in our home, generally in 2017, was the comical pointlessness of our lives. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and particularly <laughs> of our writing. So when I was putting, the, that's what I felt anyway, when I was putting the essays together, um, I mean, the timing was in some ways random. My editor emailed me and said, do you know there's enough essays? You could have a collection. It's not something I usually think about very consciously. Uh, but then the election happened. And, it, you know, it's really hard to write, read essays about, I don't know, a film about 24-hour clock or mm. a, a, an essay about Justin Bieber <laughs> and feel that there's any reason for them you know mm -hmm. so I guess I decided to just double down on their pointlessness and and feel that they were a record of a of a different time because that's immediately what it felt like you mm. know a, a more a naive time on my part and I'm always pretty politically naive but I think I really outdid myself uh, this time around in in not expecting anything that happened and being constantly amazed mm -hmm. um, so I in that way it became a little museum of um, things I had felt I had time to be interested in, uh, like a record of having your eye off the ball, mm -hmm. <laughs> or your eye in various <laughs> unessential places. But, but, uh, but I did mean it when I wrote in the introduction that, you know, uh, in an ideal time, there is time to consider what Justin Bieber might have in common with Boober and, and what a 24-hour film about a clock might be about. 
th th that is still my ideal, yeah. a life in which those things are possible and those thoughts are possible. But I was very aware of c compiling a book in a time of emergency and activism when these things could only be held as, well, maybe one day we'll get back to yeah. thinking such non-essential things. <laughs> But, but, but yeah, that's how I put it together. But is there any sense of that as well that those kind of these so-called non-essential things are in fact the essential things? Like in some way, in um, in, in keeping this kind of uh, variety, this uh, this perspective, this kind of keeping that in our lives, it's in some way perhaps going to be the the anecdote to. I'd to like the to think that, but um, in my yeah, view, it's antidote. like a Maslow py pyramid and. And the kind of thing that I do is not even on the goddamn pyramid. Like mm -hmm. it's it's just genuinely unnecessary. But it but um, but uh, it's been meaningful to me. I, I guess I think of myself as a person made out of these kind of experiences. Mm -hmm. I imagine I'm not the only one. So I, I'm talking to those people who've also had the good fortune to be made out of these kind of experiences. Um, but yeah, it was a strange. Mm -hmm. It's a strange thing to put together. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and similarly, Nick, you you said, for example, "Feel Free" was um, was published in the New Yorker four years ago. Um, there's what there's a poem uh, entitled "Grenfell" in the uh, in the collection, um, which I, I confess, as a reader, I, I think I was expecting something uh, very different to what I got after after reading the title, um, because it's sort of it's it's engagement with. Uh, I mean, the 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 word Grenfell has become so. Um, so sharply defined uh, in the last, uh, you know, because of the, the tragedy of a year or two ago. Um, and I was just wondering, do you see it, uh, from a, whether from a personal perspective or as a, um, a sort of a, a political perspective, as a sort of a record of a particular time or a sort of transition through a particular time? Uh, yeah, I think, I mean, I think all books are that. I mean, it's mm -hmm. sort of, you can't, you can't help it but be that. Um, yes, yeah, so Grenfell is the tar in London that um, went on fire um, and one of the, the poems in the book is an elegy for it but it kind of it refuses to break into sort of sentimentality it's all written in bureau bureaucratic language in some way um, uh, yeah you know the, the, this question about art politics what, what the worth of it you know it's the old question and I sort of think in the end like all art is a political intervention simply by being it is, it, it's a form of hierarchy. You choose what to write about. You, you, you know, it, that sort of question I feel has been answered in some ways. And, and even providing a kind of complication of the received narrative is itself political. I think of that Levinas line about um, once you actually look someone in the face, killing is forbidden. I think about that again and again in terms of Northern Irish writing. Like the, the whole point is to kind of complicate the narrative. So. I'm not. I don't. Th I don't think of it as Eddie does in those bold terms about the pointlessness of it. It seems to me incredibly pointed. Like it seems to me, what are we fighting for if not the right to make art? Like uh, so. Right, but that Grenfell poem is a good example. Like th there, there is an argument for kind of political art that the point is just to repeat the fact of the monstrosity. It was a monstrosity. This is a monstrosity. But the effect of that is limited. It's the same voice you hear in the news. It's the same voice of journalism. What I don't think, though, that, that... Well, for example, in that Grenfell poem, that it's not repeating the monstrosity. No, but that's what I'm saying. What yeah. interests me about it is that it was about the monstrosity itself, which is a kind of bureaucratic, bureaucratic mindset, which allows right. people to die by language. for a convenience and mm -hmm. so that houses some distance away the cladding on that building was aesthetically pleasing for the rich people yeah. who live around the corner in Notting yeah. Hill so the poem is about that kind of bureaucratic mentality bureaucratic mentality which to me is so much more powerful than the poem which said did you know all these people died wasn't right. it terrible that, do that does nothing to me the repetition of a horror it was painful wasn't it painful I'm interested in the structural right. reasons that happened but and to me that poem is about that right. and the power is from that I think the only point of going into a poem is when the poem is surprising and, and just repeating that it's terrible that people die, that's not an interesting poem. And it makes no change. It's just a sentimental ritualization right. of, a, of a complete horror. We live in that neighborhood. You can get on the train and see this coffin. Mm. It's absolutely extraordinary. And to yeah. try and find language that's equal to it, I remember when it happened, I'm sure like many London writers always asked to write about it, and I f couldn't. I actually, sorry, mm. couldn't. Anyway, um, you mentioned a, a mindset, and I, I, I think maybe we'll just leave this more of a, as, a, as a teaser to the audience before you read to us and before we go for questions. But um, you had a story published in The New Yorker just today, oh, yeah. <laughs> um, Now More Than Ever, which I think right. is 
It's fascinating. I mean, such an extraordinary story um, and so pertinent to what we've been talking about tonight because it seems to to bridge the divide almost between essay and fiction. I mean, there's a certain tone to it, uh, particularly when you're talking about a movie in it, which feels very essayistic. Um, it's written in, in the first person again, and yet it's, it is a piece of fiction. Right. Um, and I say, without perhaps giving too much away or dwelling on it, because I suspect it's probably more important for people to read it uh, before hearing us talk about it. But I was just wondering, is that something uh, having... Uh, now written, for example, a novel in the first person and having written uh, sort of a great deal of essays and kept up your essay practice for a while. Do you feel that's sort of a direction your, your fiction is taking or do you think that um, was very specific to this particular story? I, it's a do, it was a lot to do with what I was reading. I was reading a lot of Bartholomew and, in fact, Joe O'Neill's recent stories in New Yorker and thinking about a voice that was kind of loose and fast enough to talk about... Uh, an atmosphere. It's quite hard to talk about an atmosphere. Like my, my brother's a comedian. His job, a comedian's job, is to try and say what people feel but don't articulate, mm. right? And because he's trying to get laughs, it's usually done in a fairly broad way. So when you go and see a comic, your main instinct is, "Oh, that's what I've always felt," but mm -hmm. I never had the words. And my brother finds words for you, and you laugh, and it's cathartic. It's, yeah, uh, it's funny because it's, it's true. It's funny because it's true. <laughs> um, but when I'm writing fiction, uh, I, I love comedy but I'm but I'm always aware of not not entirely wanting to give that catharsis like part of mm -hmm. comedy is like laughing off and feeling comfortable in it and I kind of wanted to write a story that didn't uh, allow for that but but captured an atmosphere and I guess when I was reading those 60 stories by Bartholomew which I haven't read since I was 20 I was just struck by how radical that book is mm -hmm. right it's just so wild and I tried to think of any of those stories being published in the New Yorker today, no offense to New Yorker, or, you know, many journals, and I, I couldn't see it. You know, mm -hmm. they are so just out there, off base, uh, really crazed and incredibly political at the same time, and the tone of them is fundamentally insincere and irresponsible, even though he is writing about politics in the fiercest way. And I, that interested me, that there was a way to write politically which didn't take on the the, for me, fake sincerity of the political voice that was still free and still wild and still funny. And I thought, how is it possible that he could do this in you know, the late 60s, early 70s, and now I feel so constrained? Mm -hmm. um, so that was really what it was about, just thinking, how is it possible to get a bit of this freedom back that, they, that so many writers had in the late 70s, this real wildness, mm -hmm. but, but at the same time dealing with easily as serious a political situation mm -hmm. in America but still with this freedom. I, I was really kind of thrilled to reread him. Mm. So it came out of that. As I said, quite an extraordinary story. And I do recommend you all now, uh, uh, once the event is over, get it on your phones or buy the magazine. It's really, yeah, yeah, really, really quite something. It's, it's Zadie's story. I'm the author. <laughs> it's this one right here. <laughs> the title is Now Got More Than Ever. Got a red scarf on her head. Um, so before we come to you for your questions, we're just going to hear uh, Zadie read a short extract from, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. from one of her essays in Feel Free. Um, I, hi. Hey. I'm a little shorter than him. Yeah, there you go. A lot shorter. Um, I'm just going to read a few lines of a uh, last essay in the book called Joy. I guess uh, this is like as close to my, uh, the kind of stuff my brother does that, uh, that I do. It's really just about trying to exp describe an emotion. Um, so that's what this is. Joy. It might be useful to distinguish between pleasure and joy, but maybe everybody does this very easily all the time and only I am confused. A lot of people seem to feel that joy is only the most intense version of pleasure arrived at by the same road. You simply have to go a little further down the track. That has not been my experience. And if you ask me if I wanted more joyful experiences in my life, I wouldn't be at all sure I did, exactly because it proves such a difficult emotion to manage. It's not at all obvious to me how we should make an accommodation between joy and the rest of our everyday lives. Perhaps the first thing to say is that I experience at least a little pleasure every day. I wonder if this is more than the usual amount. It was the same even in childhood when most people are miserable. I don't think this is because so many wonderful things happen to me, but rather that the small things go a long way. I seem to get more than the ordinary satisfaction out of food, for example, any old food. 
An egg sandwich from one of these grimy food vans on Washington Square has a genuine power to turn my day around. Whatever is put in front of me food-wise will usually get a five-star review. You'd think that people would like to cook for or eat with me, but in fact I'm told it's boring. Where there's no discernment, there can be no awareness of expertise or gratitude for special effort. Don't say that was delicious, my husband warns. You say everything's delicious. But it was delicious. It drives him crazy. All day long I can look forward to a popsicle. The persistent anxiety that fills the rest of my life is calm for as long as I have the flavour of something good in my mouth. And though it's true that when the flavour is finished, the anxiety returns, we do not have so many reliable sources of pleasure in this life as to turn our nose up at one that's so readily available, especially here in America. A pineapple popsicle. Even the great anxiety of writing can be stilled for the eight minutes it takes to eat a pineapple popsicle. My other source of daily pleasure is, but I wish I had a better way of putting it, other people's faces. A red-headed girl with a marvellous large nose she probably hates, and green eyes and that sunshine complexion composed more of freckles than skin. Or a heavy-set grown man smoking a cigarette in the rain with a soggy moustache, combined with a surprise, the keen eyes, snub nose and cherub mouth of his own eight-year-old self. Upon leaving the library at the end of the day, I will walk a little more quickly to the apartment to tell my husband about an angular, cat-eyed teenager in skinny jeans and stack-heeled boots, a perfectly ordinary grey sweatshirt, last night's makeup, and a silky Pocahontas wig slightly askew over his afro. He was sashaying down the street, plats flying, using the whole of Broadway as his personal catwalk. Miss Thang, but off duty. I add this for clarity, but Nick nods a little impatiently, there was no need for the addition. My husband is also a professional gawker. The advice one finds in ladies' magazines is usually to be feared, but there is something in that old chestnut shared interest. It does help. I like to hear about the Chinese girl he saw in the hall carrying a large medical textbook, so beautiful she looked like an illustration. Or the tall Kenyan in the elevator, whose elongated physical elegance reduced every other nearby body to the shrunken, gnarly status of a troll. <laughs> Usually I will not have seen these people. My husband works on the eighth floor of the library, I work on the fifth. But simply hearing them describe can be almost as much a pleasure as encountering them myself. More pleasurable still is when we recreate the walks or gestures of voices or voices of these strangers or whole conversations between two people in the queue for the ATM or two students on a bench near the fountain. And then there are all the many things that the dog does and says, entirely anthropomorphized and usually offensive, which express the universe of things we ourselves cannot do or say to each other or to other people. You're being the dog, our child said recently, surprising us. She's almost three and all our private languages are losing their privacy and becoming known to her. Of course, we knew she would eventually become fully conscious and that before this happened, we would have to give up arguing, smoking, eating meat, using the internet, talking about other people's faces and voicing the dog. But now the time has come. She's fully aware and we find ourselves unable to change. <laughs> Stop being the dog, she said. It's very silly. <laughs> and for the first time in eight years, we looked at the dog and were ashamed. <laughs> Occasionally the child too is a pleasure, though mostly she's a joy, which means in fact she gives us not much pleasure at all, but rather that strange admixture of terror, pain and delight that I have come to recognise as joy and now must find some way to live with daily. This is a new problem. Until quite recently I had known joy only five times in my life, perhaps six, and each time tried to forget it soon after it happened, out of the fear that the memory of it would de dement and destroy everything else. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, okay, it's over to you. If you have uh, a question for, for Nick, for, Zaid, for Zadie, for both of them, just raise your hand. Do uh, try and keep your questions as brief as possible so we can get through as many as possible. Um, who would like to kick us off? We'll begin with this lady over here. We'll just get the microphone to you. Um, what advice do either of you have for an artist or writer that is trying to express themselves using their own voice? Um, microphone, yes. First use of the microphone. Um, for, for me, the question is always, what's your own voice? I guess I'm the wrong writer to ask that of because I don't... Uh, 
I just, I just don't feel that way about it, you know. I couldn't even tell you now uh, what my voice sounds like. like. I'm very aware as a teacher when I have students that they can be heavily influenced by a certain voice. I'm sure you have it in poetry teaching, right? So in my case, someone like George Saunders has this incredibly distinctive voice and I can have years where all my students sound exactly like George. But I don't think I've ever had a student who sounded like me. I don't feel I have any sound, you know. Maybe we're invisible to ourselves that way. Um, but f for me, um, uh, my voice, it, it's different for different writers. My voice is genuinely just the amalgamation of other books. Th that's the truth of it. Other people's books that I've read for a long time added to my sensibility, but I would say my sensibility is a tiny proportion of the difference. The me is like maybe 2%. The rest is books. Books, films, fr just influence. So, so my advice is always to be as open as inf to influence as possible. Um, yeah, um, yeah. R read. Uh, it's so boring to say it, but read widely, and then when you find something you love, read deeply in into that person. Read everything they they wrote, and then hope that you write enough until you sound like no one but yourself. Um, but expect to sound like almost anyone else at the start for many years. That's just the nature of the beast, I'm afraid, yeah. Right. Good evening, Zadie Smith and Nick Laird. I thought I would never say that sentence, but here we are. <laughs> I just wanted to ask a question about the fact that your two books have the same title. I just wanted to ask you, how important is a title anyway? For a book, <laughs> be it a well, collection clearly of very important because neither of us are willing to give it up. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, well, I, you didn't have to give it up. <laughs> That's fair. Um, I, I, for me, it's everything. It's unfortunate that Nick is always coming up with titles that I like. That's happened a few times. On Beauty is named after a poem of his as well. So I have previous here. Yeah. Well, the previous goes way back. We were at college together, and I remember, we haven't talked about this, but I was thinking about this the other day. Like 21 years ago, my, I got a knock on the door, and Zadie goes, um, oh, it's our history of the English language oh. final in like a week, and I haven't been to any of the lectures or the classes. I need all your notes and essays now. <laughs> and I was like, oh, yes. okay, <laughs> here are all my notes and essays. I was thinking about it, it's the precedent was set a long time ago. <laughs> And I was just like, yeah, all right, there you go, sorry. <laughs> that did happen, I forgot that, yeah. Okay. Okay, yeah. Uh, yeah. A ti a ti uh, sorry, yeah, so a title, a title is important, I think, yeah. Um, partly because, you know, I like, I like titles that have sort of assonance, like um, the rattle bag, that little, or, or feel free, or seeing things, or... A little chime in the title, I like a lot. I, I like it. It gives something memorable, and I like a kind of uh, uh, what's the word? Epistemological chime, a kind of um, a little uh, undercutting of sense, a revitalization of cliche, like you're getting feel free or to a fault or whatever the thing is. Um, something weird about it, I, I think, is sort of important. But, you know, there's a lot of great titles out there that don't do that, but, uh, but, but I... That aren't yours, that I could have chosen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I could have. No, no, but you can make your own up. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing that could happen. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I would just like to say about this title, Feel Free, which makes me think fancy free, and it's very easy, but actually, if you think of both words, feel is absolutely enormous. Just ask anyone who's been through therapy and free is enormous too so you have two words which have unbelievable meaning I mean in terms of philosophy and etc huge huge baggage with feel and with free but in fact putting them together one thinks oh feel free <laughs> right it's a really good title I know <laughs> I know dude tell me about it oh boy Anyone have a question not about the title? I think that's key now. <laughs> Hi, uh, thanks so much for being here and talking with us. My name is Minal Hill. I'm a student in the US. Um, I was, Zadie, you brought up uh, the idea of 
feeling constricted. And um, I was wondering, aside from like doubling down on pointlessness that you did with this latest collection. I should have called it that, doubling down on pointlessness. Sorry, I wrote it down, on. I think you did say that. <laughs> I did. <laughs> um, oh, called the collection yeah. title. Um, I was wondering, uh, I guess in your other works, how you kind of confront that constriction and how you get out of that, especially with, I know you said for you it doesn't feel like an intimacy for me uh like i'm a muslim immigrant and i again that sense of constriction is right. really challenging and i'm wondering how you navigate that sorry I, sorry I think, Nick, this I, is no about no i think if you're a writer it's the least you can do like i grew up on on great myths of writers who really were free who were sexually free, who were socially free, who had new arrangements, communes, who were radical political activists, who got on bloody bikes and traveled across America. I'm not doing any of that. I am living a perfectly normal bourgeois life. So given that that's true, if you can't be free mentally, wh what the fuck are you doing? I don't really see the purpose of being a writer if you can't have some area in which you're free. So I, I always felt that growing up, you know, you have a dream of the writing life you're gonna have and some of these dreams are incredibly romantic and extensive and um, but I think there is also, I mean, the one who's most inspiring to me is Ballard. Ballard, as you probably know, brought up three children after he was widowed in the most boring English suburb it's possible to imagine, and wrote these fucking extraordinary books, like a man who's entirely free here. And I just cling on to that model, that it is possible to, to live a life which is perhaps is not fascinating from the outside, but in which you're mentally free. But the idea that you can't even be that, that someone's gonna be inside your brain saying, don't say that, don't think that, that's not allowed. I can't, I can't bear that, because that's the freedom that I have. So that's, that's the freedom you have to take. Cool. Yeah, hi. Um, I'd like to bring the conversation back to voice. Um, earlier, Zadie, you said that you wanted to forget Wolf in terms of essay writing, and I was really curious as to why you wanted to do that, and also if you have any voices that you really admire uh, author-wise. No, I, I love Wolf, but it's, it, the fact remains, it's a very English, very stylized, very upper class, racist, racist yes, racist. For, like, I often, when I was a kid reading Wolf, I, you know, as a kid, you always think, I love this writer, and could I have tea with them? And if you're a black woman writer, the answer is almost always no. They don't want to have tea with you. At certain points of history, they would have lynched you. Other times, they just wouldn't have recognized you as a human. So there's all these kind of no's everywhere. And uh, with Wolf, that's very evidently the case. You know, and part of my affection for F Forster when I was young is that I felt in him a kind of openness. You know, it, it's sentimental, and he's very sentimental about India and all the rest of it. But he was open and interested in non-white English people, where Wolf wasn't at all. And you can find all over her diaries bits which make me really are painful to me. But the, the genius and the, the mixture of emotion and logic, that's what I think is so attractive to me in Wolf and what I was so, um, such a sucker for. But, but being in America, reading people whose voices are freer, or on the other hand, someone like Didion, much more controlled, or like Kathy Ackham, really wild. You see all these other possibilities outside of this kind of drawing room prose. So sometimes I just like to get out from under it. That is, I'm afraid, all we've got time for uh, tonight. Um, I wouldn't be doing my bookseller's duty if I didn't recommend uh, you taking the two feel frees as a set. Um, I would say don't, don't believe the, the explanation that it was just Nick's title and uh, Zadie stole it from him. I think, I think they do work very well as companion pieces. I certainly perhaps felt encouraged to read them in that way by the title. And I think they do, um, they do dialogue with each other in, in, quite, uh, in quite an interesting way. Uh, you'll be relieved to hear that uh, we have stacks of copies of uh, Nick's Feel Free and Zadie's Feel Free, as well as both of their backlists available here. Um, Nick and Zadie will be signing right here. Please do just bear with us, because uh, there, there are a lot of you here, so we're going to try and... Uh, clear the chairs away, get the signing queue organized, so please don't all rush the stage at once. Um, otherwise, stick around, have a glass of wine with us, and uh, please just join me one more time in saying thank you to Zadie Smith and to Nick Laird. <laughs>